Well, it's certainly good to see all of you today. Happy to have this opportunity to worship together with you and also to be able to uh, share with you some other parts of God's Word. Um, this particular uh, lesson was inspired by this song that we just got through singing. Uh, we sang it on Wednesday night. Brother Steve directed it, and I got to thinking about waiting on the Lord. And um, that expression, I know that it's found a lot of places. I was thinking in the, in the Word of God, I ever preached a sermon on waiting on the Lord, <laughs> and I hadn't. And it was, a, it was a very fascinating study. I hope that you'll enjoy looking at these verses. It's something that is found many times in the Word of God. Of course, David uh, faced many trials and tribulations and wrote many of the Psalms talking about how the Lord was the source of his salvation, that the Lord is the one that was going to see him through, even though he was surrounded by uh, enemies and people that were using every form of deceit and guile to try to bring him down, that he'd wait on God and God would help him. And God did, didn't he? <laughs> David was not disappointed. And David says, none of us will be ashamed if we wait on the Lord because God is faithful and he'll do and act in a way that's right. So when you talk about waiting on the Lord, it's putting your faith and hope in God's providence. Uh, I appreciated some of the songs that were led that talked about God's providence. Uh, certainly is what a lot of these scriptures have as their background, that God is in control, that His laws are what run this world, and that if you'll wait, these laws are going to work, and things are going to work out. Right? God has set all of these moral rules in order, and He controls this world, and the future's in His hand. And if we'll wait on God, His plan is going to get worked out. So we need to live in harmony with that plan and keep waiting on the Lord because He will act and He'll provide the things that we need. Hosea in chapter 12 and verse 6, he lived in a very wicked time. Therefore, return to your God, observe kindness and justice, and wait for your God continually. He tells the faithful people of his day, he tells himself, Keep waiting on the Lord. Do it continually and do what you're supposed to be doing. And God's going to take care of things in His good time. Wait for God. When you look at a definition of waiting, I looked up all the... You wouldn't believe the number of Hebrew words that are translated in these passages, wait. <laughs> but they all mean wait, right, when you get to the bottom line. So I just looked in the Webster's Dictionary. It's to stay in a place and anticipate until, and of course in our context, God acts. We're waiting on God. We're staying in our place and we're waiting and we know that God will act. To be on the watch, to look forward to what? To God acting. Wait on the Lord. The faithful people keep trusting and waiting on God. We trust God to provide the things we need. And among these things that are mentioned by David and others... He guides us in truth. He's the one that shows us that right way of life that we sang about, that we need to walk in. And He gives us guidance. He gives us justice. It seems like the wicked have the upper hand and people fret and get upset over the wicked, but God's way and His providence will bring about justice. Much in this life, but certainly on Judgment Day, there's going to be justice handed out to the wicked and to the righteous. And we are waiting on God's mercy. We all need forgiveness of sins. We need to be, uh, the people, especially in the Old Testament, they're looking ahead to the Savior coming and providing that perfect sacrifice. We're looking for that day when we're going to gain, you know, perfect uh, victory over the wrath to come and be able to enter into heaven, right? We're waiting on God. He's going to act and we can count on that. So we wait on the Lord for salvation. And we see that reflected often. Really wait on the Lord when you get to looking at all these passages. It's a synonym for faith. <laughs> Waiting on the Lord. You're trusting in God. You're hoping in God and all of His Word and promises that He's going to do the things that He said He's going to do. So you have an expectation that God is going to bring victory to His people and His cause in the end. And so it is patience. But you hang in there in difficult times and when things don't seem to be going right, 
because you know that God is going to act. And you're waiting silently, patiently doing your duty, and that God is going to act. Hebrews 1, or Hebrews 11 and verse 1, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So we're waiting on the Lord. We trust in His Word, and we have assurance that He's going to do the things that we're hoping for. Those things are going to come to pass. In Hebrews eleven six, 6, And without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. This waiting on the Lord is because you believe God really exists. That God is the one that rules over this world. That His laws are the laws we all live under. And that those laws are working themselves out. And that if we want to you know, be right with God, we're going to practice what He tells us to do. And we're going to trust in what He says. And it's going to work out. We're going to see God's will done uh, through His providence in this life. And ultimately on uh, Resurrection Day, He's going to reward those that stay faithful to Him. So let's begin to review these passages, and some of them I may even have to skip over, but we'll, we'll do the best we can. Uh, waiting for God, this faith and hope is in God, and you can see the psalmist is wanting forgiveness. That's what Psalms 130 is about. In verses 5 and 6, it says, I wait for the Lord, my soul does wait, and in His word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. So he's got a desire for the Lord to act, to bring this forgiveness, bring this atonement. And of course he did, didn't he? Jesus came. <laughs> and there is that means for us to be forgiven, and God does forgive. And he says, I'm longing for it and waiting for it, the God to act like a watchman in the night, and he's waiting on the sun to come up. You know, you're worried about the enemies. You're worried about what's out there in the dark. And you're waiting on the light. We are waiting on the Lord and He's going to act. And let's hang in there and wait. Guidance and providence in our life. David, oh, he went through so many struggles and trials on his way to the throne and even after he got the throne. And he had to wait on the Lord to work things out. He wasn't going to take things into his own hands. He waited on the Lord. It says, lead me in, the, in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day. David knew these things are going to get worked out. God's going to act. I'm going to stay faithful. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. God's going to take care of Saul and all of those enemies out there that are working against him. God's going to take care of it. And he's going to lead me in the way that I ought to live. And we should do the same. True conversion, moral strength is something that waiting for the Lord gives you. It's part of the benefit. Uh, Jeremiah talked about the benefit, what the goal is of our preaching and our teaching. What's the benefit that comes to us from trusting God and waiting on Him? Well, it builds us up morally that, to stand up and do what's right when you know God's going to act. Right? You believe that? <laughs> it gives you power. Right? It gives you strength to know, yeah, it looks like everything's falling apart and so on and the wicked are getting away with everything or whatever, but God's going to act. So I'm going to do what's right, and I know God's going to do His part. And He certainly will. We need to be truly converted to the Lord and do our part and trust God. That's our passage we had on the first slide. Therefore, return to your God. Hosea is all about trying to get these people to repent in that wicked days in Israel. Come back to God. Come back to Trusting Him like Jacob did, if you read the verses before. Observe kindness and justice. You treat your fellow man the way God wants you to treat them. And wait for your God continually. God's going to deal with the wicked. He's going to deal with the things that are out of order. He's going to act and through His providence. In chapter 27 of Psalms, in verse 14, what our song was based on that we sang. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, Wait for the Lord. What's going to give you courage and power to go on and do the right thing every day, day after day, even though there's many discouraging things going on? You're waiting on God. You know God's on His throne. You know He's going to act. You know His will is going to be worked out. So you keep on doing what you've got to do with strength and courage. Waiting on God. Isaiah 40 and verse 31. Let those who wait for the Lord... 
He says, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not grow weary. How do you see some of these saints in the Old Testament hanging in there through trial after trial and, and getting up and, and going on? Or you see Paul get beaten in one town and he gets up and goes in the next one and starts preaching again? He was waiting on the Lord. He knew the Lord was there. He's ruling. He knew how it's all going to turn out in the end. And it does give you the ability to soar on eagles' wings when you remember God is the one that's going to act. And you know that he's real and he's a rewarder of those that seek him. It can give you power in life. Wait for God. His justice against the wicked and for the righteous is surely going to come. You might not see it right now, but wait. Wait and it will come to pass. Many of us have seen it in the past happen. (laughs) That things have worked out where some of the great enemies of God and his people have been brought down in a moment. And certainly on the last day, it's certainly going to work. So we need to keep waiting. In Isaiah 30 and verse 18, Therefore the Lord longs to be gracious to you, and therefore He waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all of those who long for Him. Those that wait on Him, long for Him. We know He's on our side. He's a God that's gracious to His saints. And although it might look bad right this moment, we know it's just a matter of time till His justice is going to roll forth. And the wicked are going to pay and the righteous will be rewarded. Psalms 37 and verse 7, David says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of Him who prospers in His way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Do you get to fretting about that kind of thing sometimes? (laughs) David says, Don't do it. Wait on God, and you're going to find out. God's going to act, and things are going to change. Psalms 37 and verse 9, For evildoers will be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord, they will inherit the land. How many times in the history of God's people has that come to pass? That He's cleared out the wicked, and it's the righteous that are left. Noah, (laughs) we can just go through the Bible, right? Where it started over and over again. And finally, of course, on the last day, it's going to be permanent, isn't it? It's going to be a new heaven and new earth for the righteous to dwell in. Proverbs 20 and verse 22. Do not say, I will repay evil. Wait for the Lord, and He will save you. Now, the New Testament teaches us that, doesn't it? Don't take your own revenge. Leave room for God. Wait on God. He's going to deal with the wicked. We don't have to do it. All we have to do is do good. That's our job. God's going to deal with paying back the wicked for the wicked things they do. And how does He do that? Well, He does it through His providence is one way. We have civil government that God has authorized and established, and they punish evildoers. That's their main job. And we see what kind of chaos there is when the job isn't done by the government, don't we? Society starts falling to pieces. But as a rule, that's the government's job, and that's what they ought to do. So we don't have to worry about that part. Many evildoers that try to abuse us or rob us or whatever, the government's going to deal with paying them back, right? That's their job. God has appointed that in His providence. Sin's consequences are going to find them out. These evildoers that uh, are so opposed to the teaching of truth and holiness, you watch over time, you're going to see... God's going to get them, right? And He gets them with His justice, but it comes through providence, through the natural working of law. God outlaws things that are immoral and wicked because they're hurtful. They'll ruin your life. And so when the wicked stand for those things, what's going to happen to them in the long run? Their sins will find them out. They'll get sick. They'll have addictions. They'll have accidents. They'll suffer death. They'll be cut off just like David said they would. In Proverbs 5 and verse 22, His own iniquities will capture the wicked, and He will be held with the cords of His sins. Don't we see that working out? Just wait on the Lord, and these people will be dealt with. In Proverbs 11 and verse 3, The integrity of the upright will guide them, but the crookedness of the treacherous will destroy them. In Proverbs 11:5, 5, But the wicked will fall by his own wickedness. 
Many times God uses, through His providence, one wicked person to destroy another. <laughs> yeah, they may have picked on you sometime or another, but then they pick on the wrong person, right? And they get justice handed out to them that comes from other wicked people. What's the big problem with getting in a gang? What We hear about these murder rates going on in these big cities. Who is it that's shooting each other? It's the evildoers shooting each other a lot of the time, right? It's a lot of the gang members. Proverbs tells us not to get in a gang. Don't think we're going to go out and rob people because you're really destroying yourself. Because according to God's laws and providence, it's going to come back to bite you. You're going to reap what you sow. But they lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who gains by violence. It takes away the life of the possessor. They punish themselves. Their gang will get them later on. Their other mafia boss will wipe them out or whatever. That's what happens. You live by the sword, you're going to perish by the sword, right? Isn't that what Jesus told the disciples? That's what the saints put their faith in. They're, they have perseverance because they know those that live by the sword are going to destroy by the sword. That's what ends up happening. We don't have to do it. God's providence takes care of it. Their own schemes destroy them. You, they dig a pit for somebody else and they fall in it themselves, a number of those passages say. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness before God, for it is written, He is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. Talking about the worldly wise. Oh, they are so smart, they got all their special schemes and all their programs, and they end up destroying themselves with their program. God catches them in these wicked schemes, end up uh, bringing justice to them. If that's not direct enough through this general providence that happens, there's also special providence. Now, I can't tell you a whole lot about special providence. It's where God intervenes through natural law to wipe somebody out. We know in the Bible it happens sometimes that God just strikes somebody, right? When does He do that today? Is it just general providence or specific? I don't know, unless it's revealed in God's Word. But we know that he has many times in the past. Herod Agrippa put James, the apostle, had his head chopped off and was trying to kill Peter. And then you remember he took the praise to himself that belongs to God and God sent an angel and struck him and he was eaten with worms and died. That's what happened to him. That enemy of God. Enemy of the church. Ananias, the high priest, you remember he ordered Paul to be slapped on the mouth. And Paul said, the Lord will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Just a few years later, they were a bunch of the radicals that led to the war with the Romans, came into his inner room and drug him out and, and killed him. So he was struck, wasn't he? Nabal in the Old Testament, that man that dishonored David, David had protected his sheep, had been a wall to him. <laughs> And yet when harvest time came and he wanted some help for himself and his servants, Nabal spoke evil of David and David was thinking about killing him. But uh, Nabal's wife came and talked David out of taking his own revenge and God struck Nabal ten days later and killed him. So God takes care of the wicked. Just wait on the Lord. You don't do evil. Don't return evil for evil. God's going to take care of the wicked. He's perfect at it. And on judgment day... We know the Lord is coming with flaming fire, with His angels dealing out retributions to those that do not know God, do not obey the gospel. And these are going to pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord. So there's a day coming when God's justice will come. We just have to wait on the Lord. When it comes to wicked nations, the scriptures tell us the same thing. God is going to take care of wicked nations. We don't have to be concerned about that. Wait on the Lord and these wicked nations will be judged. And the Lord does that in time. In Zephaniah 3 and verse 8, Therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up as a witness. Indeed, my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out on them my indignation, all my burning anger, for all the earth will be devoured. By the fire of my zeal. Back in that day, they were worried about, you know, the Babylonians. 
Babylonians got rid of the Assyrians. Then God raised up the Medes and the Persians. They got rid of the Babylonians. Right? It just God takes care of one nation after another. In His good time, He shakes the whole world up. Just wait. Don't fret about it. God's going to take care of it. Habakkuk was told the same thing. Oh, there's a lot of wickedness going on. Why don't you do something? Well, I'm raising up the Babylonians. and He says, they're worse than us. Why? And he said, I'm going to deal with them. Right? God's going to deal with it. Habakkuk 2 and verse 3. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens towards the goal and it will fall. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come. It will not delay. So God's going to act. Just wait on the Lord. Put your trust in Him. He's going to take care of things. It's all going to work out. So we just be faithful and do our duty and God will take care of the rest. Does Jesus still do the same thing today? He's ruling on the throne. He's got all authority in heaven and on earth. And the book of Revelation tells us He's acting. He's got a sharp two-edged sword given to Him by God. He speaks against a nation and it will fall. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. The Roman Empire was awful mighty. They were out to get the church, wipe us out. The Lord acted, and there's no more Roman Empire, is there? <laughs> no, it's been happened over and over, and we should wait on the Lord. Wait on his word. Let's be sure that we have His authority to act before we act. We're told in Psalms 106 and verses 13 and 14, they quickly forgot His works. They did not wait for His counsel, but craved intensely in the wilderness and tempted God in the desert. How many times do we read about that in the Bible? Where somebody doesn't wait to find out what God's Word has to say. And they start acting on their own and doing their own thing, and it always turns out bad, doesn't it? Wait on the Lord's counsel. Make sure you know what you're doing. Make sure you've got God's Word on what you're about to get involved in. You know, Noah was a man that found favor with God and came through that flood. He did everything according to what God commanded him, so he did. That shows his faith. And you look at that flood... And you see Noah's faith and the way he waited on God and trusted God. He wasn't going to act without God's word. The total time that the flood waters were on the earth is 313 days. The water prevailed 150 days. And then they began to recede. And the ark landed on Mount Ararat and the water started going down. And the waters went down 163 days for them to go back down. And then he uncovered the covering on the ark. And we're told that Noah sent out those different birds and so on. But he waited to come out of that ark until God told him to come out. He didn't presume to come out. He waited until God told him. Fifty-seven days he waited to come out of that ark. And then God told him and spoke to him, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. So there we have an example. Wait on the Lord. Wait on His Word. Man was caught picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. And the brethren, uh, the Jewish brethren there, they brought the, that man to Moses and said, What do we do with this guy? He broke the Sabbath day. And they put him in custody. says, We'll wait for the Lord's counsel to find out. The Lord hadn't revealed what to do as a punishment. And they were told they needed to stone him to death. We're told about those that missed the Passover because of uncleanness. And they said, we want to take the Passover. Let's wait on the counsel of the Lord. <laughs> Let's don't act on our own. And they found out a month later on the same day, they would be able to do the Passover if they missed it. So God provided an answer for them. But they didn't act presumptuously. Saul, he's somebody that didn't wait on the Lord, right? He was supposed to wait seven days for Samuel to come and offer the sacrifice before they went to battle with the Philistines. And Saul got impatient. He got to the seventh day. He still didn't see Samuel. And he offered the sacrifice himself. And right after he got through, Samuel shows up. If he had just waited on the Lord, waited a little longer, everything would have been great. Instead, he found out the kingdom was not going to stay in his family because of what he did. So wait on the Lord's word. Wait on the Lord for salvation, and the Lord will surely save. 
He was going to bring those people back out of captivity. He was going to bring Christ into the world to be an atonement for our sins, to give us victory over the devil. Wait on the Lord's salvation. It's, uh, it may tarry, it might be a while, but it's going to come. And that's what Jeremiah said. You know, Jeremiah was a man with a lot of trials, wasn't he? He went through all kinds of struggles and trials, but he kept hanging in there because he waited on the Lord. Right? And he advised, even during the book of Lamentations, after the destruction of Jerusalem, he was still telling people, wait on the Lord. He's going to straighten things out. He's going to do what's right. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him. To the person who seeks Him, it is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. Here's David preaching to himself in Psalm 62. It says, My soul waits in silence for God only. From within is my salvation. In verse 5, My soul waits in silence for God only, for my hope is from Him. Repeat that. <laughs> Repeat that to yourself. The Lord is my God, and He is the one I wait on. And He's going to take care of things that are good for me in my soul. Micah, he lived in a wicked time with Isaiah. And uh, right before the Assyrians came and all of the problems they had in Jerusalem in the days of Hezekiah, says, But as for me, I will watch expectantly for the Lord, and I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. <laughs> That's waiting on God, right? All of this chaos is going on, but I wait on the Lord, and I pray to Him, and I know He'll hear me. God's waiting to be gracious to His people. In Psalms 123 and verse 2, Behold, as the eye of the servant looks to the hand of their master, as the eye of a maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until He is gracious to us. You think about a servant, a slave, and they work for their master and everything they're going to get is going to come from their master's hand, their power. We look to God that way. We know God is in charge. He's ruling. He's the one we look to and wait on. And He's going to take care of things for our soul. All things will work together for the good of our souls. We need to keep waiting. Well, that salvation came. They were all waiting on back there in the Old Testament, didn't it? There had been people waiting and waiting for the Savior to come. And He came. <laughs> he was brought as a baby up to the temple, you know, to get His... Uh, a sacrifice for the firstborn, and we're told in Luke 2 and verse 25, there was an old prophet that was there, been waiting on the Lord for a long time for salvation to come, and he saw it in Jesus Christ. And there was a man in Jerusalem, his name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And he took Jesus up in his arms and started prophesying about him there in front of Mary and Joseph, and Talking about what was child was going to do. In verses 29 through 32, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. All that he'd been waiting on all of those long years, he's finally seen it in Jesus Christ. And there was an old woman that was there at the temple, a prophetess named Anna. She also had been waiting, and she got to see it too. And all of us are going to see it too if we'll hang in there. We will see the salvation of the Lord. We're going to be able to enjoy it. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 38, at that very moment came up, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continuing to speak to Him to all of those who were looking for the redemption of Israel or, or Jerusalem. So... Here's this Anna. She went out and told everybody about the fact that the Redeemer's come. Wow, what word was going around in those days. Look what Isaiah said was going to happen in chapter 25 and verse 9. And Jesus came and fulfilled it, didn't He? And it will be said in that day, in the days of Christ, Behold, this is our God for whom we have waited, that He might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in His salvation. That's what Simeon was doing and Anna was doing. The wise men were doing, right? You just go around. They, he came just like it was prophesied. And they were rejoicing in it. Wait on the Lord. 
The apostles were to wait on the blessings of the Holy Spirit and His guidance that was going to come to them. While He was going to reveal the gospel plan of salvation that was going to be able to be preached and people be saved. And Isaiah prophesied of that too. For from days of old they have not heard or perceived by ear, nor has the eye seen a God besides you, who acts in behalf of the one who waits for Him. Things ear hasn't heard and eye has not heard are going to happen and going to be revealed. They were told to go to stay in Jerusalem and wait for the Father's promise in Acts chapter 2. And we know the Holy Spirit did come in Acts chapter 2. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that passage from Isaiah is quoted and applied to the gospel coming and the apostles receiving that revelation through the Holy Spirit. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which has not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love Him. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit reveals all things, even the depths of God. All those things they were waiting on, Paul says, they've come to pass in the gospel. We've got those things. Now we need to wait for the second coming, don't we? Those people were waiting on Christ to come and salvation to come and all of those things. Well, now we're in the gospel age and we're waiting for the Lord to come back. Keep waiting on the Lord. For we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. The day when we will be found righteous and be able to have that crown of righteousness. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 7, So that you may not, may lack, not be lacking any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. They got all the gifts they need to do the work they need to do. They're waiting. How do you describe Christians? People that wait on the Lord, right? We're waiting for His glory to be revealed, for Him to come back. In 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 5, Therefore do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. The perfect judge is coming. We don't need to pass judgment before the time. We can't see people's motives. But don't worry, the day is coming when everything's going to be brought to light about why people were doing what they do. And it'll be a perfect judgment that God gives. So wait, and the Lord is going to take care of giving the proper judgment. How do you wait? We wait like a patient farmer for the Lord to bring in the harvest. And He's going to do it. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. He doesn't say the same thing. All those Old Testament saints were told, wait on the Lord, be patient. God always comes through. His coming is certain and sure. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 11 through 13, Since all of these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat? But according to His promise, we are looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Wait on the Lord, we're going to get a new place to dwell where it's all going to be righteous. A new order of things is coming. And we can enter into that, but what should we be doing now as we wait? Have holy conduct and godliness. Have reverence for God. Respect Him in all that you do and say. Looking for and hoping, hastening the coming of that day of God when He acts. In Jude one twenty one, keep yourself in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. So let's keep waiting on the Lord. You see that theme? And I had to throw out some verses. I couldn't get them all in. <laughs> but isn't it a wonderful concept that strengthens the whole idea of faith and hope in God? And let's, let's be cheered up and be uplifted with strength and fly on the wings of eagles. Because we trust our God, and we know He's going to act. 
This time we want to extend the Lord's invitation to those that are present. If you're here and you've not put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of your soul, we want to encourage you to believe in Jesus Christ with all your heart. Repent of your sins, confess His holy name, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. If you need the prayers of the church or you need to res- uh, the Lord's help in any way that we can help you with, won't you come as together we stand and sing. Boy, sing, I tread life's way.